uh, welcome to this session uh, that takes place within our Rethink uh, CE series here at the German Marshall Fund. Uh, I'm delighted uh, uh, that so many of you took the time to join us for this, uh, for this session this afternoon. Uh, clearly, wherever you are, uh, this is the topic that uh, uh, is on the minds of uh, a lot of people around here and, uh, and beyond. Uh, my name is Jörg Fabrik. I'm a director for Central and Eastern Europe at the German Marshall Fund, uh, based out of the Berlin office. And I have the pleasure this afternoon uh, of leading us all through this uh, session. Um, the session, I mentioned it, is part of a series uh, of the Rethink CEE Fellowship uh, here at the German Marshall Fund. Uh, we established this fellowship program uh, two years ago with the idea to support next generation thinkers, analysts, uh, civic activists also, uh, in doing uh, policy research uh, on current issues facing the region of Central and Eastern Europe uh, at large. Uh, this is a program that uh, every year supports about a dozen uh, younger colleagues from across the region uh, to do an original piece of policy research to present uh, uh, a policy paper uh, at the end that we publish at the German Marshall Fund. Uh, and today my pleasure is uh, to host this session uh, to present uh, the paper uh, and our colleague Pavel Havlicek um, he uh, joined us last year in this, uh, in this program and over the last year has been uh, uh, conducting his research, now finalized his, uh, his policy paper. Uh, I will provide the link uh, to this paper in a minute. It has just gone online uh, yesterday. Pavel is a research fellow at the Association for International Affairs in Prague in the Czech Republic. Uh, his geographic focus is the Eastern Partnership region, also Russia, where he zooms in on uh, democratic developments, on civil society support, but also on issues like disinformation and, uh, and foreign influences. Uh, Pavel previously worked at uh, the European Parliament, at the Czech Foreign Office, uh, at People in Need, a very large Czech development NGO. Uh, and also the European Endowment uh, for Democracy. Pavel, we're delighted to have you here this uh, afternoon. Welcome. Uh, Pavel is joined by Richard Youngs, uh, who's a senior fellow in the Democracy, Conflict and Governance Program uh, based at Carnegie Europe. Uh, he's also a professor of international relations at the University of Warwick uh, and previously headed the European think tank Frida. Uh, his thematic expertise is in the area of EU foreign policy, uh, uh, on issues also of international democracy, uh, topics that he has uh, published a variety of uh, books over the years. I think the count is at 13 at the moment. Uh, Richard, welcome to the session. We're glad to have you uh, here with us today. Uh, before we move into the substance uh, uh, matter of the session, let me remind you of a few housekeeping uh, rules. Uh, we're still all a bit new to, uh, to these online formats, so I think it's, uh, it makes sense to uh, refresh our memories on some of those basics. Uh, the first is this is a public event. Uh, this is on the record. Uh, it will also be recorded uh, to the benefit of some colleagues that uh, weren't able to join us here today. So uh, we ask for your understanding that uh, the recording will also be uh, shared. Um, we will have uh, introductory inputs first by Pavel and, uh, and Richard, and then we will go straight into question and answers. Uh, questions can be submitted exclusively uh, through the chat function. We know that this is not ideal for some, uh, but uh, we have made the experience that this allows us to uh, accommodate more questions than, uh, than otherwise. So uh, bear with us um, and submit your, uh, your questions in the chat. You can do so anytime throughout the inputs initially and then obviously in the, uh, in the conversation later on. Uh, I will uh, read out or paraphrase these uh, questions for our two speakers. Um, and uh, perhaps also group them uh, a little bit in, in thematic blocks. Um, finally, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the link uh, will go online now. I'm putting it into the, uh, into the chat as we, uh, as we speak, so you should feel free also in listening to us 
uh, to Pavel and Richard in particular to browse through the uh, paper yourself and see if uh, this triggers additional questions uh, with all of you. Uh, now on to the substance of, uh, of the session today, uh, which is titled Supporting Civil Society in the EU, Lessons from the Bloc's Democracy Support in Eastern Europe. Uh, this is a theme that really combines two very broad and complex uh, aspects. Uh, the first of these is obviously the state of democracy inside of the EU. Um, I don't think there's a need to spell this out in detail, but this is clearly an issue that has been on the rise for uh, certainly the last uh, 10 years. We have seen democratic backsliding in a number of uh, EU member states, especially also in, uh, in Central Europe. Uh, we see an open disregard with some governments for the rule of law uh, or the independence of the media. We see shrinking spaces for civil society uh, in, uh, in many areas. We see an open assault, uh, basically Europe-wide, uh, by uh, a new set of parties, whether we call them populist, far-right or otherwise, uh, that, uh, that really thrive on the rejection of some basic democratic principles and, uh, and values. Uh, and it seems that for a long time, the EU was not particularly responsive to this, uh, to this development and really only kicked into action uh, in the last couple of years. This now seems to be an issue that is, uh, that is high on the agenda in the, uh, in the EU uh, and is being uh, finally addressed as we, uh, as we all hope. Uh, now, the interesting catch here is that uh, uh, these, these designs, these policies to uh, support and bolster uh, democracy and civil society inside of the European Union uh, can obviously hugely benefit from experiences that the EU has made itself uh, uh, in supporting democratic reforms uh, elsewhere in the world, especially also in its own neighborhood. Uh, and this is really the second aspect of this, uh, uh, of this session. Um, the EU is a very substantial player uh, when it comes to supporting democratic development, civil society, independent media uh, elsewhere in the world, especially also in, uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, it has overall uh, uh, quite a good track record. Um, uh, it has, uh, has managed to exert very positive influences in, uh, in many places. It certainly hasn't been without its flaws. There have been failures, um, uh, but overall there is, an, uh, there is a huge experience by now to, uh, to draw on uh, when it comes to, uh, to supporting democracy. Uh, and this is certainly something that should come in handy as the EU thinks about uh, action uh, to bolster democracy and civil society inside of, uh, of the very union. Um, so in, uh, this, is a, this is a nexus between the state of democracy inside of the EU and its own experience with supporting democracy elsewhere uh, that, uh, that has rarely been met, in, uh, that has rarely been made in, uh, in my opinion. That's really the, uh, uh, the merit of, uh, of Pavel's paper. It establishes and spells out this, uh, this nexus and uh, sort of in a, in a very structured way gives us, uh, gives us a sense of where the points are in, in its own experience that the EU can draw on uh, to support democracy uh, at home. So it's really my pleasure to have Pavel, uh, or Pavel, uh, my apologies, uh, uh, to, to give us a sense of uh, the, the gist of the paper and the, the primary recommendations that it has in store for the EU. Pavel, you want to go ahead? Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you so much, colleagues, also for bearing uh, with us. It's already 1st of July and for some uh, the summer break is slowly but surely starting. Also uh, for others, it is a whole marathon of uh, uh, Zoom conversations, Zoom uh, conferences. So we are very glad that you are here with us, actually. But uh, the reason why we are trying to organize this uh, topic at the earlier stage of the uh, racing CE is actually this uh, its timely character because next month we are supposed to see more negotiations about the MFF, the multi-annual financial framework of the EU, and more negotiations. And I will uh, tell you why uh, I believe there is a, a paradox when it comes to uh, support uh, to democracy and civil society. So thanks once again for being here, and I will have now my 10 minutes for uh, the presentation itself. I will try to be brief and uh, 
potentially come back to some of the issues. So first, I already hinted on one of the two paradoxes that I want to introduce for actually uh, choosing this topic. And thanks, Jörg, once again, for actually outlining the, the scope of the paper, because this is indeed a hybrid exercise looking both abroad, but also inside of the EU and looking for the missing link. And as I see it, and many other colleagues, and I know that Richard will also have, uh, have to say something about this, is that uh, democracy and civil society are so far a missing link in uh, the post-recovery, uh, post-pandemic um, uh, EU support and post-recovery um, EU's, uh, EU's uh, budgeting and uh, MFF. Because uh, while we have seen a number of other areas, including uh, industrial production, obviously healthcare systems and others, uh, to where the EU is planning to invest its, uh, its funds through MFF, but also uh, next generation EU um, funds, we have not seen so much uh, when it comes to democracy and civil society. So this is first uh, of the paradoxes. Because obviously, as Jörg mentioned, uh, EU is indeed a global player when it comes to support of democracy and civil society. The second paradox, and this is, uh, this is uh, closely connected to the second element of the paper, is that we have seen over the last couple of months and in the last years, in fact, much more being done uh, on, on the pro-democracy side outside of the EU than inside. So as Jörg mentioned, there was a certain resignation, certain uh, 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 leaving certain things uh, to the member states from uh, the EU institutions point of view and much more has actually been done um, in the Eastern Partnership, in the Western Balkans and outside uh, of the EU in general rather than uh, at home. So that's why it actually led us to this um, realization and this plan to overbridge this, uh, to me, uh, an artificial gap. Uh, when it comes to pro-democracy and pro-civil society support. So now I will already jump to the paper itself, uh, which we actually decided to uh, divide into four uh, parts. First, um, this gives actually an overview of the available tools to the EU. Uh, and here I will mention uh, the two that I use most prominently, which is the European Endowment for Democracy, of which I also have a previous work experience, and also the so-called AIDHR, so the European Instrument for Democracy and Human Rights, which I use frequently as some examples of what the EU can be actually doing at home as well. Uh, there are obviously other ones as well, partnership instrument, um, democracy uh, cooperation instrument and other ones, uh, which will be uh, in the next uh, MFF united into this uh, NDICI, the, the blended common instrument. But so far we have experience with this rather decentralized, decentralized uh, approach also obviously on the democracy front so 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 this is this is this is this was the first part uh, for the following ones i actually selected uh, three case studies uh, namely ukraine georgia and moldova in which i tried to dig deeper for uh, the eu's successes but also certain limitations or failures uh, from which we should take be be taking these lessons uh, for finally bringing them back home uh, in the last paper uh, part uh, so on the successes part, actually, what I, I can see and was clearly identified is this, this holistic approach of the EU to support of civil society, because uh, we have seen this uh, on the rhetorical level in terms of recognition, but also partnering uh, up with the civil society when it comes to pushing for the associated agenda in case of the three, but also um, other partnership priorities in case of other Eastern Partnership countries, but also uh, others, other partners outside of the EU. So we have seen this holistic approach, which is also materializing in the EU institutions uh, itself. And here I will just give example of the uh, support group for Ukraine, which is a very solid tool uh, streamlining the EU support to uh, the Ukrainian uh, society and civil society. Uh, I will jump to limitations already for the sake of uh, saving time. And here uh, we have three uh, seen three most uh, um, prominent ones. Uh, it is the uh, one size fits all, uh, certain rigidity uh, when it comes to um, programming of the EU's funds, um, when it comes to also civil, civil society support, um, uh, other, uh, the same principles being applied in both Ukraine and Azerbaijan 
in Georgia and Belarus and so on and so forth. We have seen that in the past. So there is, uh, this is one of the limitations for sure. Another one is obviously the nature of the EU foreign policy making uh, and speaking with not, uh, with not one single voice as we see uh, mostly in the case of United States, but a much more fragmented um, landscape actually. Uh, obviously member states being, uh, individual member states being on one side, but then obviously also the EU member states having their own say in the debate. And finally, I uh, had at the uh, lens actually uh, a deep look into how uh, practically uh, the EU support to civil society is, uh, is decentralized, is implemented. And here uh, I have a certain criticism towards the practice of subgranting, which uh, we see uh, frequently applied in Moldova, but also the other uh, partner countries, which is uh, often lacking a certain sustainability, sustainability a component, but also strategic vision for the future, actually, uh, beyond uh, the, the short and medium um, term perspective. Uh, the criticism here also goes to um, the capacity of the EU itself uh, and it's aimed at the EU delegations, which obviously has done a tre tremendous job during the pandemic, but uh, previously there was uh, quite a strong criticism of, the, of their capacity when it comes to strategic communication, but also simply being present on the ground, especially in the regions, having the know-how of the situations and so on and so forth, simply because the member states never really uh, allowed to uh, for, for EES, the European External Action Service, to be established as a fully fledged diplomatic service. So finally, let me come uh, to the final bit, uh, which is the lessons learned, what we can actually take out of these positive and negative sides. And here, uh, I would have three uh, broad sets of recommendations. The first one is related to one very concrete instrument, which is uh, which is being planned, which is now in making, uh, and, and is called uh, Rights and Values Program, which is uh, which was agreed actually by all three major parties uh, in in Brussels, uh, the European Parliament, Commission, and uh, the Council of the Member States, uh, but still is in making in a sense that uh, not the final amount of money actually dedicated to this program standing outside of the control of the member states is decided and also um, uh, basically uh, the, the simple nature of the program who does what and where and f by whom funds are for example disbursed to the civil society this is still also uh, one big question mark and we have some uh, recommendations and, and uh, tips uh, from the external instruments uh, on this side um, this leads me to the second broad uh, set of recommendations, which is which has to do with uh, the operational side of the EU's uh, support to civil society, because we simply see that certain tools and certain um, agendas, whole agendas, are actually uh, lacking and are missing in the EU um, component on the EU domestic side. And this is, for example, a strong and 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 and, and solid support to the human right defenders or uh, the uh, election observation missions, which are done um, both by the AIGDHR or uh, another point that we mentioned in the, in the study. Uh, these are related to very rapid and um, confidential sometimes uh, support to civil society organizations, which are on its own side done by the European Endowment for Democracy, which is a number of other advantages that I can go in more detail if you like. Um, Finally, uh, finally, my last recommendation is related to uh, the capacity uh, of, um, of, of the EU and also conf uh, the, the conditionality, which we, uh, we have seen that works uh, very, very well uh, in, uh, in the case of uh, EU's external policies, for example, when it comes to microfinancial uh, support or technical assistance to some of the partner countries, but we are not seeing that um, uh, yet uh, in the EU itself. Obviously, there were proposals going on these lines done by uh, Czech uh, Euro Commissioner Jera Jourova. Uh, these would be uh, uh, going along the lines of rule of law uh, mechanism um, and, and certain violations, obviously, er erosion that um, Jörg already mentioned at the beginning, 
Uh, but this, uh, in my opinion, should go much further from there, and it should not be limited only to disbursement of structural and uh, co cohesion funding, but also to civil society mainstreaming and also compliance with the rule of law criteria. So, so this is this is this is uh, one one side of the story, and another one is already, as I hinted on, um, done with the capacity of uh, the EU itself, the European uh, Commission, the European Parliament, uh, which obviously. Both of them have uh, their own offices in member states, but uh, again, what we see and what we criticize outside of the EU is that so many of the crucial assets and, and, and important, uh, important pillars of, of these institutions are actually outsourced to third parties, including communication, uh, which is a big issue, uh, and, and obviously the whole component of communication about uh, the European values is something uh, that we should definitely have in, in our mind and uh, learn from uh, when it comes to the external uh, support. So uh, I think I will conclude here. I already hinted on a number of issues. We can uh, go in more detail. And uh, obviously, even the paper itself is rather limited in terms of uh, its own uh, capacity and, and, and uh, something that we can pass on. So we will be very happy to, to go in more details and, and discuss further with you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Pavel. Uh, we will certainly go into much more detail. I think you gave us a lot to chew on already. And the first to, uh, to chew on some of these questions, obviously, uh, Richard. Uh, I can't really think of anybody who would be more uh, more suitable to uh, uh, to comment and also discuss some of these questions. This is right down your alley, uh, Richard, uh, and that of your program. Uh, let me remind us all that uh, was one of your colleagues at Carnegie, Tom Carruthers, who uh, wrote a piece quite a few years ago by now that was titled uh, Look Homeward, Democracy Promoter. Uh, it basically made a very similar case in, relate in relation to the United States. Uh, which is uh, as important as the uh, as the EU in the area of democracy assistance, and obviously faces similar issues uh, at home. So, in this very spirit, um, uh, please, Richard, uh, go ahead with your uh, comments and, and thoughts on what uh, Pavel presented. Um, well, thank you to GMF for the opportunity to uh, comment. It, it is a very timely issue, and it's a very very good report on a very timely um, issue. I can imagine that perhaps for some people on the call, this issue of civil society funding perhaps doesn't seem quite as important as the big geopolitical issues we're talking about at the moment, like COVID, the standoff with China, the difficulties in relationship with President Trump. But actually, for, for me, it is because this is the bread and butter of EU external relations. It's the area where Europe spends a lot of its concrete resources. So it's, uh, it's vital that the EU spends these resources in a way that maximizes its political impact. And one of the abiding criticisms of the EU and also member states programs over many years is that really they fail to do this um, in, in terms of fully dovetailing the huge amounts of money they spend on civil society support uh, with uh, the bloc's overarching foreign policy priorities. So for me, it, it is a first order issue at this particular juncture. Uh, these criticisms that the EU has failed to maximize its, its potential through its civil society partners have been around for a long time. At the same time, the EU has improved, and has improved quite notably in, in recent years. Both the European Commission and the six or seven member states that bilaterally dedicate significant amount of resources to democracy and, and human rights. So a lot of this funding for democracy and human rights has become more agile, more flexible. It has begun to uh, locate uh, newer, uh, quite dynamic, uh, pro-democratic uh, partners. Uh, the use of this sub-granting uh, provision sounds quite technical and arcane, but in fact, it's very important because it's allowed European funding to get down to some of the grassroots organizations that in many uh, eastern neighborhood and southern neighborhood countries have become some of the leading players in pushing for human rights protection and democratic change. And, and, and as civil society organizations have faced the um, assault from authoritarian regimes over recent years, the EU 
has done a lot of good work in providing basic physical and legal protection for some of the organizations uh, most at risk. So the EU has improved, has improved over recent years, but unfortunately, as the EU's programs have improved, so the difficulties have also become more intense. Why? Because regimes are becoming cleverer um, and more severe in the way they try and prevent this civil society funding from gaining any traction. And, and, therefore, and therefore, that's the basic context that tells us that the EU does need to move more and improve the agility and effectiveness of its civil society funding as a first order issue of importance in its promise to become more geopolitical. And for me, this is where Pavel's report is at its strongest, saying where the EU has implemented many important improvements, but still needs to go further. Many CSOs around the neighborhood are still more vulnerable today than they were 10 years um, ago. They still need much more um, reliable core support from European uh, donors. Uh, digital tools are being supported by external donors, but can often leave uh, organizations actually more vulnerable to the surveillance being implemented uh, by regimes. Far too much European money still goes to gongos, the kind of NGOs that are too linked into uh, regimes. Um, and, and still, and still uh, not enough kind of core support is going to uh, local civic organizations separate from independent, uh, separate projects that organizations are running with the European Union. So if you package all that together, the imperatives of how the EU still needs to improve, for me, it tells us that the EU still needs to fully link together its civil society funding uh, with its overarching geopolitical strategy. For me, that's the real challenge uh, that lies ahead. And it's necessary to do that because other powers, other powers across the neighborhood are politicizing civil society. So whether we like it or not, civil society in the Balkans, in the East, in the Southern neighborhood is being drawn into a kind of more politicized geopolitical dispute. And the EU can no longer run these civil society programs as a, as a kind of standalone area separate from its core foreign policy priorities. And this is important right at the moment, right at the moment, because this is a big moment, it strikes me, for civil society organizations across the neighborhood. The COVID virus is leaving civil society very, very vulnerable. In Carnegie, we've been hearing from a lot of civil society interlocutors that have had their funding cut off uh, because of the virus, many donors are, re are, are pivoting um, their funding in, uh, quite justifiably, quite understandably, into priorities linked to the virus and to economic recovery. And there is a danger that civil society organizations could be left um, without resources just at the moment when we need those civic organizations to help implement effective post-virus um, policies. So I think um, it's understandable that the EU's priorities may lay elsewhere at the moment, but in a way the, the moment also means it's even more important that the EU safeguards funding for civil society that is finding itself in this very, very difficult situation. So then, then my observations, Jörg, on the, on, the, on the external funding question. If I may just have 30 seconds on the second part of Pavel's paper. Okay which is the, the issue of the internal funding. I think this is what is very, very interesting about the report, because Pavel is absolutely right that to date, relatively limited linkages have been made between this very rich experience in external democracy and human rights funding on the one hand, and the internal democracy challenges that you uh, laid out for us um, at the beginning. Uh, in Carnegie, we've been calling for a kind of joining together of these two worlds for many years. There is still reticence on both sides. Donors that uh, work on international issues uh, tend to want to avoid getting drawn into sensitive domestic political um, uh, battles. Uh, those working inside the EU often are a little bit reluctant to think that there's lessons to learn from uh, international policies. So I think Pavel is absolutely right that this is an obvious area where uh, better linkages and better lessons can be learned to increase the effectiveness of EU funding inside the EU. It's perfectly understandable 
that when we talk about Poland and Hungary and illiberal trends in other member states, most of the debate so far has been focused on Article 7, on punitive conditionality, on the issue of EPP membership. What one understands that they are the priority issues. But I would argue, along with Pavel, that we do need to complement those debates with a more kind of bottom-up approach uh, based on European funding helping to kind of cultivate greater democratic capacity in these countries over the longer term. The academic literature is quite clear that in general, uh, punitive approaches tend to work only in very uh, specific circumstances in actually advancing democracy and human rights norms. So, of course, there are differences between uh, external countries and uh, member states, but I do agree with the gist of the report that lessons can be learned uh, from this very rich world of external funding for what the EU could do through its values, rights and values programs uh, within the EU itself. The need for funding to be agile, um, the, fun the need for funding to address core political issues. The EU has done a lot of funding in member states, but it tends to be funding that goes to kind of, uh, programs designed to um, kind of bolster the EU or sell a pro-EU message rather than going to core human rights and democracy. Uh, values. The funding needs to avoid getting uh, drawn into right versus left um, ideological battles. It needs to stick to these kind of core uh, values that should transcend left-right uh, divisions. Um, uh, crucially, crucially, it may be that some of this funding is not best managed by the European Commission. Uh, I think this is one of the lessons from the European Endowment for Democracy, that there is value in having a kind of um, a, a semi-independent uh, organization that can offer funding without getting drawn into these political battles in very, very sensitive circumstances like Poland, Hungary and, and other member states. And crucially, and this will be my last issue, um, this kind of funding uh, for uh, democracy activists and human rights uh, protectors is needed within member states. It's not a panacea. In itself, it's not going to cure all the democratic ills that we know beset these countries. Um, and it's not a standalone alternative to the kind of um, uh, rigorous, assertive political backing that is needed uh, for these values. If there is one really crucial element, lesson to be learned from external funding that can be imported into these internal issues, is that you cannot simply offer a little bit of human rights and democracy funding and think that that can generate significant pro-democratic momentum if you don't also have the full panoply of political and diplomatic instruments backing up that funding. Uh, so I, I think for me that's, uh, you know, the, the EU is beginning to move into this area, uh, belatedly but correctly, but I still think it needs to consider how to implement this kind of fully committed and political approach to democratic issues inside the EU. I think my, my final recommendation uh, wrapping all this together would be this, that some of the civil society activists that have received money over many years outside the EU, I think could be used in a useful capacity to give advice and guidelines for democracy activists inside the EU itself. I know we have many of these um, activists from Ukraine and other uh, and southern countries as well on the line, it seems to me that they could be very, very useful players in helping the EU to learn the lessons from its external policies and bring them in more systematically to its internal policies. Thanks a lot, Richard. Uh, you can imagine that quite some of your, uh, your points, especially on the external and civil society support, struck a particularly strong chord with me. Some of you may know that my day job at the German Marshall Fund is to run some of our civil society assistance. So I can, I can only wholeheartedly uh, agree with you. Uh, now, on to questions. We have quite a lot of questions here already. Uh, I'm not even going to attempt at, uh, at grouping them uh, anyhow. I think Richard and, uh, and Pavel also see them. Uh, let me sort of uh, paraphrase them, uh, perhaps. The first is from Roland Freudenstein. Good to see you, Roland. Um, 
it's basically about some of the legitimacy of our external uh, support. Uh, uh, Roland points out here that uh, uh, it is hard to strengthen uh, the rule of law or civil society for that matter uh, among some of our Eastern partners if we have uh, uh, governments inside of the EU that display uh, strong, strong deficits. And in our day-to-day -day work, this is exactly something that we do come across. Uh, there is a legitimacy issue here whereby many of our partners, whether it's in Belarus or elsewhere in the, uh, in the Eastern Partnership, basically point out those, uh, what they call double standards. So uh, here's a first question for, uh, 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 for both of you. Uh, how can we maneuver that? Um, how can we get around that, uh, uh, that weakness? Um, there is a second uh, very specific question from uh, Alexei Demyansky uh, that is uh, relating to the media action plan. Uh, uh, Pavel, you have uh, uh, mechanisms that you describe in your, uh, in your paper. Uh, uh, Alexei wonders whether there is more information available on uh, the media action plan. Uh, it's a very specific question. A third one comes from Nathalie nougay uh, I hope I pronounced that uh, name halfway, halfway correctly. Um, there is a question on the EU communications uh, uh, of its values, uh, the outsourcing to external actors. Uh, Richard uh, uh, pointed to that, that there, is a, uh, that there are mechanisms uh, with the EU that basically uh, work through intermediaries, through external actors. So uh, there's a question here on, uh, on the communications that's uh, that's involved with that. I think the EU has long acknowledged that uh, it needs to actually get stronger in communicating its positions and support also in the area of civil society to citizens of, uh, of neighboring countries. Much the same will certainly also go on the uh, uh, for the mechanisms that, uh, um, uh, that the EU devises on the inside. Um, a fourth question and then I'll uh, play it back to you too. Uh, it comes from Daniel. Uh, I don't know if that's one or several questions actually, uh, but uh, uh, it uh, sort of uh, reflects some of the, the point that uh, Roland Freudenstein has in his uh, question um, uh, with legitimacy. Uh, EU institutions are reluctant to support independent civil society organizations in EU member states uh, because there are uh, governments that, that push back um, uh, with the argument that this is an interference, there's the sovereigntist argument that is uh, that is presented uh, uh, in uh, in response. Uh, so, what are the ways of uh, breaking through that blockade? I mean, that uh, that is something. This argument of uh, interference is something that uh, we have ever so often met in, uh, for instance, the Eastern Partnership countries, or in several of them, perhaps not all of them. Uh, and now we're in a situation whereby we're we're facing that very argument from, from some EU member governments uh, themselves. So uh, uh, those four questions for the time being, uh, uh, Pavel, do you want to go ahead? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, great questions, uh, starting from Roland's. Uh, thank you so much, Roland. I think this is absolutely a relevant uh, question. We are dealing with this on a daily basis in, in Visegrad region, obviously, in Visegrad countries, which, uh, you know, in, in my case, in the Czech case, we have a whole program that uh, Richard actually mentioned, this transition, a trans uh, program of the Minister of Foreign Affairs. This is actually supposed to share the uh, best practice from the political and economic transition with our Eastern neighbors, but also uh, the Western Balkan countries. And then obviously these kind of questions come very often. Okay, are we offering, do we have really the know-how to offer? So obviously there is a lot of rethinking uh, these days, but I think we should, we should uh, continue with that. Um, because I still believe that the transition of the post-communist countries into liberal democracy and market economy, no matter how problematic this now sounds somewhere in, in Hungary, is still relevant. We, we have something to offer, I believe, but what is important here is that we should be open and not be patronizing, but really be open and have this kind of backdoor, as Richard hinted on that, that we should be listening to what is the experience in the region now and what uh, what we should be taking back home. So again, I think the, the kind of bridging of uh, and having open doors uh, from outside 
to back inside is much, much relevant here. And I think you also mentioned uh, in your question this kind of rule of law mechanism. Here, I think still, um, obviously, the EU is only learning a lot, you know, how to measure quality of rule of law mechanism. There is a new uh, kind of comprehensive study, actually, that is supposed to, to, um, to evaluate quality of uh, rule of law systems uh, all across the 20, 27 countries. And there is certain, um, there are certain like principles in place, this scorecard and so on. So I think still here, uh, the, <laughs> this, this lessons learned actually goes the other way around than, than not, not to be learning so much from our Eastern partners. When you look at the situation of Georgia, of Ukraine still until today, there are still quite a few problems here. But, you know, having the doors open is, is, is my, is my uh, answer to this. Then the second question on the, uh, if I, got you well, uh, Jörg, there was also this EU uh, democracy action plan. So this is this is uh, one of the things that I also mentioned in the paper, and I didn't go so much in detail in my uh, short uh, uh, intervention at the beginning. Obviously, uh, this uh, democracy action plan is one of the tools uh, which gives hopes, let's say, this is the opportunity now to really move on with certain things, including support to, uh, including support to uh, civil society, independent media, and we have seen that already. During the pandemic, the Commission for the first time really disbursed some funding for independent media, and we should we should be, be on it and continue. But it is also to fight with democracy. So there are a couple of things, and, and also, uh, very importantly, um, election component. So, so and, and this is obviously connected with uh, foreign interference, but this is also in the Democracy Action Plan, which is another um, another opportunity except for the rights and values program. There was also a hint on this um, uh, demo, uh, demo, uh, media action plan, but uh, all of these things, including the uh, democracy action plan, are still in making. It is not clear who does what within the commission, uh, how much it will be legislative or non-legislative uh, acting and so on and so forth. So here again, uh, this, this paper might actually help to uh, kind of put things together and ideas together. On a third question, this was related to the communication element. And I think uh, here we are seeing problems on both sides, uh, obviously coming from the EU institutions when, when we heard uh, stories about Ursula von der Leyen actually getting uh, a kind of uh, consultancy company in Berlin to help her with communication. Okay, this is this looks quite serious, right? So obviously, much more needs to be much much more needs to be done, and much more resources invested in this in this uh, in this area. And um, I mentioned uh, the the issue of outsourcing, and I would say that. Uh, there are good ways and bad ways to outsource. Good way is to let the, for example, the East Stratcom Task Force to help with this information with uh, proactive uh, kind of EU uh, presentation in the neighborhood and so on. This is this is one way, but there is also other, which is outsourcing to third parties. And there, there has been a number of problems uh, from across the, uh, the neighborhood and there it needs to be serious uh, uh, um, kind of reflection on this. Uh, obviously what we call on here uh, is to build in-house capacity in the delegations but also in the commission to much more uh, invest into this crucial area because perception is nowadays a crucial thing and it's, it's, it's everything. Uh, finally on the fourth question, um, it, is, uh, it is a lot uh, um, to do with this bottlenecks, you know, and the current negotiations about the multi-annual financial framework. Because if we say, look, there is opposition from the member states, now is the right opportunity to really do something about this. Because obviously there's such a strong pressure from countries like Germany, obviously, which is taking over uh, the presidency just today, but also Netherlands and others who are saying, okay, we can't be possibly just dispersing money to some of the corrupted countries um, and, and their regimes. I will mention very concretely Hungary here, but also Bulgaria and other ones, you know. And we have, we have heard it related to agriculture and the common agriculture policy. We have heard it elsewhere. Uh, you know, uh, kind of football stadiums being built in, in, in Hungary for EU money and so on and so forth. And this just can't continue like that. And there are a couple of ways around that. Obviously, I've already mentioned about this conditionality. So we, um, 
So obviously we can we can be saying you co you either comply with criteria or you don't get anything. This is this is one way. This is this is the hardest one. Uh, then there is ob there are, uh, other other ways to avoid this kind of foreign interference element, and this uh, has to do with uh, somehow like a civil society and democracy and the rule of law obviously mainstreaming so yes you want this money we will give you this money but you will have strength strings attached to that you will uh, also you will only get this assistance once you spend this and that amount of money on civil society for example uh, but obviously here uh, the issue of gongo that richard mentioned is is something to, to bear in mind and finally um, the the final component is the rights and values program because obviously here is the big conditionality, yes or no, but there is also this kind of grassroots component. You don't like that? Okay, let's give more money for, uh, for civil society and grassroots organization through, through a specialized program in the EU itself. So this I'm offering as a third option on the table. I'm not saying one is excluding the other one, but uh, there, are, there are different options in here. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Pavel. Uh, Richard? I'll be very brief. I, I agree with uh, Roland that um, this internal democratic erosion is depleting the EU's legitimacy um, internationally. So it's not just a challenge related to one or two truculent member states, but it's a, it's a dynamic that's beginning to affect the EU's whole kind of global identity. And it's true that these uh, problems are evident another for their civil society organizations, including in Germany, France, Italy, Spain, the Netherlands, UK. I mean, pretty much, pretty much all uh, member states have suffered this kind of, these kind of civic restrictions in recent years. For me, that means that in the future, I think human rights and democracy support, uh, support will be more a matter of building networks between civil society partners inside Europe and outside Europe, both within Europe and beyond. There are actors pushing for democratic uh, change, for liberal values, and there are authorities seeking to make their life more difficult. It's no longer a question of the EU versus uh, external countries. It's more a question of a, a battle between liberal and anti-liberal forces transcending EU borders. So that's, that's on uh, Roland's question. I think uh, Natalie refers to a very, very important area of communication. It's a huge uh, topic. I'll just make one very, very modest uh, contribution to that, which is that in terms of communication, it seems to me that the EU um, is mistaken or constantly to talk about EU values. It seems to me we should be talking about rights uh, and, and core democratic values and get away from talking about EU values that sometimes feeds into this impression that the EU is, is promoting one kind of political agenda, which, which is not the case and should not be the case. It's about supporting these core norms and values that are not really European specific or even EU specific uh, values. And I think I, I would kind of flip the way that EU frames its communications. And then br very briefly on the third question about um, the sovereigntist pushback, um, I think uh, Pavel is right. I would use this kind of very soft form of conditionality I don't believe in cutting off funds completely to um, uh, Richard. We seem to have lost you, Richard. We can barely hear you at the moment. Um, maybe you try to reconnect, uh, maybe that fixes it. Okay, Richard will join us back once uh, uh, once the technical issue hopefully uh, subsides. Uh, we have a very steady stream of very good questions coming in here. Uh, so let me uh, uh, let me take the next uh, block of them. There's a first question from Stanislav Gonjar. 
uh, from uh, Moldova, as far as I can tell. Um, it's a bit of an evergreen question about core support uh, uh, to NGOs. Um, I mean, uh, many of us in this field will know that uh, this is an eternal uh, question to which extent uh, support should be going to projects and programs on the one hand, uh, as compared to core and institutional support on the, uh, on the other. So the question here is, um, how, uh, uh, to which extent this can also go into into breadth that is not only to uh, a small number of select, very established organizations in countries, uh, but also to medium-sized NGOs that are in many ways uh, an important backbone to uh, to civil society in each country. Uh, so that that question on core support and uh, a broader group of uh, of recipients is being posed here. Um, a second question from uh, Stephanie Schiffer from the European Exchange here in, uh, in Berlin. Uh, uh, the question to Pavel especially is that uh, whether you are aware that the rights and values instrument uh, uh, was said to be shortened by about uh, 20% uh, in the MFF, uh, MFF uh, negotiations. Um, uh, how this can be uh, addressed, perhaps, or, uh, perhaps brought back uh, on the agenda and, uh, and remedied. Uh, then we have a question from Zsuzsa Seleni, um, uh, again uh, relating to the EU negotiations on the, uh, on the MMF, uh, this time uh, in relation to the new recovery fund, uh, where the question is, uh, um, whether rule of law conditionality, as uh, as discussed, is not going to fall victim to the uh, basically to the uh, to the discussion within the EU uh, between the frugal countries and the uh, and the southerners. Uh, and finally, a question from uh, Christina Gerasimov from the German Council on Foreign Relations. Um, uh, which asks about um, the uh, uh, the capacity of the EU to differentiate between NGOs and uh, and Gongos, especially in its uh, external uh, funding schemes. Um, uh, we all know examples where uh, uh, where funding that is meant to be supporting civil society has been going to organisations that are basically. Uh, uh, substructures of state institutions or have been co-opted, so um, there seems to be a lacking uh, sensitivity in this uh, in this area. Uh, that is the first question. Uh, the other one is that uh, there seems to be a lot of untapped potential in civil society uh, in, uh, in neighboring countries, so the Eastern Partnership in particular, uh, because many groups within civil society are not able to access uh, EU funding for complicated procedures, for status questions. Uh, so uh, here again, this is something that I think we have all come across in, uh, in countries, especially the more, uh, the more closed environments. Uh, for civil society in the uh, in the Eastern Partnership. So how can that be improved in order to make EU funding more accessible also for those uh, uh, smaller yet very important civic initiatives uh, across uh, the Eastern neighborhoods? Uh, we have Richard back. Uh, welcome back, Richard. I hope uh, the technical issues have been resolved. Uh, but Pavel, go ahead with, uh, with this set of questions and then Richard comes in. Okay, uh, so I will I will start from Stanislav's question about this, as we mentioned, eternal debate. Okay, is it is it project? Is it is it capacity of the organization? In our paper, we call for a combination of things because EU should be flexible enough to address both the immediate uh, kind of um, challenges, but also to help the organization to survive these kind of um, you know pandemic situations and emergency situations. So, so for example, when it comes to and we here draw uh, lessons from uh, the European Endowment for Democracy uh, is offering both. Um, um, kind of core funding or bridge funding in between uh, different donor support pro uh, cycles and also um, implementation of very concrete uh, activities that are, you know, built around uh, festival organization, uh, monitoring of election, uh, and so on and so forth. So we should really be flexible, flexible enough, but obviously what we are now missing is the um, um, kind of 
core support uh, for organization because we have so much uh, funding actually in the EU at least uh, going along the lines of uh, project implementation and we are not really looking at sustainability and really what happens after the project what what is what is there after our own priority is actually implemented so we should be really looking looking at this inside and outside I think uh, there is there is something already being done and i mentioned um, eed but there is obviously also uh, the commission's support uh, disbursed through delegations and for for the big grants for big organization this is usually uh, multi multi year actually several years uh, of um, of supporting uh, of support for for organizations then the thing is uh, there's a different problem of availability of the funding but i will come back to this uh, second question is related to the cuts of uh, to rights and values program and yes this is actually why we also pushed and rushed this paper quite a lot to have this uh, on the table as yet another argument for restoring that um, so uh, just on monday i spoke with people um, from the from the cabinet of czech euro commissioner viera jourova and they confirmed that this negative decision has been reversed so the 20 percent down is now back but the problem is that we are still on a very limited funding so we are speaking about 680 million for the seven year period which is still very very modest if you imagine that this is for around well without now uk it's still more than 400 uh, million EU citizens. So this is still very, very modest. And that's why actually in 2018, the European Parliament suggested to triple the whole amount for rights and values program, but also the wider kind of uh, budgetary envelope for 1.8 uh, billion. So even if this negative decision has been reversed, still we are speaking about modest, uh, modest figures and not about increasing that. So we are struggling to uh, due to the opposition also from member states, obviously, to, uh, to, to, to keep even the modest figures. So this is, this is another problem the other way around. Um, now, uh, the third question about, about MFF and the new recovery fund and the rule of law conditionality. Is it falling victim? Uh, I am afraid that we, uh, we will be uh, kind of decreasing our ambition on certain things. And we spoke about support to civil society. We spoke about support to democracy due to other priorities. I already spoke about this paradox uh, at the beginning. Uh, but still, actually, some of the frugal car countries, and this, this is what you mentioned, uh, Jörg. Uh, sorry, I, it's difficult to follow uh, the, the, the question in the chat. Some of the frugal countries, such as the, the Netherlands, actually, they are one of the, these are one of the most uh, vocal about uh, the, the rule of law conditionality. So this doesn't go against each other, I would say. Yes, you might be frugal and still stand on some values. So I don't think we will uh, like completely resign. And I think here, the German presidency will be very, very instrumental if they are to keep on that uh, to, to, to keep it on the table or just resign on that and this will this will this will be the credibility of uh, german chancellor merkel if she manages to to negotiate it because this will be very very painful but i i have my hopes there Finally, uh, thank you, Christina, for this question. Uh, obviously, this is problem, uh, the NGO Gongo differentiation, this is both problem in, in the neighborhood and at home as well. If we have a look at, um, at how the Polish uh, state has uh, distributed its, its funding uh, to civil society, yes, we can call this organization to, to, to uh, on, on a numerous occasions, Gongos, even if we don't tend to call them that way, uh, actually in the EU, we, we, we don't uh, do that so often, but it is exactly this, what we know from, from the neighborhood. And my answer here is uh, going back to the capacity, because if we want to have a very good knowledge um, of the situation on the ground, we need to have people on the ground, you know, and we have to, we have to, have, we have to bolster uh, the EU delegations. And here, for example, I will uh, mention very interesting example that I actually uh, this will be also interesting for you, Christina, from, from Moldova, uh, where uh, through this, uh, there are actually three sub-granting uh, kind of mechanisms, uh, three lots uh, with three different priorities. And actually, if we have a look at uh, one of them going uh, for uh, the good governance, uh, actually, these, these guys, and this is outsourced to the local CAS office, they are struggling with uh, capacity in the regions 
but also the fact that uh, some, in some of the regions, actually, these are the local mayors who tend to establish their own NGOs and uh, because they have very good access to information. And actually, you know, it's, 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 it's very difficult to then differentiate this. So obviously, again, we can't be just outsourcing uh, the EU's uh, democracy and civil society support to even very credible organizations such as CAS, Moldova, and, and other subjects, simply because it is uh, a detective work when it comes to differentiation between NGO and, and Gongo at the end of the day. This is, this is all from me. Thank you. Thanks, Pavel. Uh, Richard, I don't know whether you had the chance to, uh, to hear still the, uh, the summary of some of those questions or else uh, read them, but please okay, go I'll just make I'll just make th th three quick points. I hope my, my link is better now. On core support, Pavel is right, this is a long running and very complicated debate. And of course, many in the EU institutions would say they don't have the procedural means often to offer core support. But it seems to me that we can't underestimate now just how serious the situation is for many civil society organizations. With the economic recession coming after the coronavirus, I think the survival of many civil society partners of the EU will, will be looking very, very doubtful. And it seems to me that if we can mobilize 1.3 trillion uh, euros internally through very flexible new recovery funds, even a fraction of that through new flexible funding to help civil society organizations in the, neighbor, in the neighborhood should be possible. So it is really quite exceptional circumstances at the moment. And if the EU doesn't react, I think the civil society it's, it's worked with for many, many years could almost cease to exist in many countries. Um, second on the rights and values instrument, um, just uh, the one point I would add here is this is an important instrument and we can argue the, about the glass being half full or half empty in terms of the amount of money available. But that isn't the only instrument that ought to be um, deliberated on, on in, in, in this sense. Uh, member states could also step forward and fund a lot of this work through their own national budgets, their national funds. I mean, at the moment, the only, mem the only country that is really putting significant resources into uh, uh, human rights and democracy issues inside member states paradoxically is Norway. And Norway's gone through a whole rich experience of learning lessons of how to keep civil society funding alive in Poland and Hungary. So member states could also be stepping forward themselves and not just relying on this commission instrument. And then third on the Gongo's point, we've been calling for this for many years in Carnegie because it seems to us that the EU should be able to define a few guidelines about what constitutes a Gongo. It's unrealistic to expect that EU funding is going to move away completely from Gongos. In some circumstances, it may be the only avenue to getting funds through to civil society in some form. But it does seem to me that the EU could at least um, make more of an effort to define what kind of Gongos are completely unacceptable from the EU's uh, point of view. But that's that's another debate that's been going around in the institutions for quite some time. And then for a final, final point, I think I got cut off before when I was making a point about um, the EU's funding to Turkey being a possible model for people who are interested in uh, funding inside countries like Hungary that will of course be very, very difficult. Some questions in the chat were about this. Um, the, the EU's experience in Turkey shows that in a very authoritarian environment, there are ways of getting funding through to uh, democracy-oriented civil society organizations. So it can be done, and that might be an example of where some of the external experience might be useful internally. Thanks a lot, Richard. Uh, there are even more questions coming in. Uh, I have at least two more for the time being. The first comes from Alexandra Yohan, um, asking the question about the, uh, the reach of civil society support in, uh, uh, in two directions. So the one is small communities, local communities in rural areas. 
typically we know that uh, civil society support is very strong in urban centers, even stronger in the capital cities, uh, but the reach into the peripheries of individual countries is, uh, is typically a much, uh, much weaker spot. So the question here is, uh, what the what the mechanisms uh, there are that we have to uh, to reach those uh, more remote uh, parts of civil society. The other one, uh, and that's an important question uh, again, is uh, about transnational civil society. Uh, I think where Alexandra is coming from, uh, who was a Rethink CE fellow herself and did an excellent paper last year on uh, diasporas, uh, Romanian, for instance, Polish, Hungarian, uh, in other EU countries and their engagement in, uh, in uh, politics back home. Uh, uh, is obviously that uh, uh, more often than not funding is very centered on recipient countries. It's very geographically based. Uh, it is very hard often to make the case that a group that is based in Warsaw, uh, but is Belarusian by origin and is in exile, uh, is a legitimate recipient for funding that is earmarked for Belarus itself. Uh, so there is uh, there is a transnational cross border element here that often is missing from the civil society support that we uh, uh, that we're able to make, uh, and that also applies obviously to uh, to groups inside of the EU. When we think, for instance, of diasporas from from EU member countries uh, engaging from uh, from abroad. Uh, so the question is here uh, whether that uh, uh, that kind of activity and groups is on the radar of, uh, of programs and, uh, and certainly should be much more. Um, and then there is a set of questions from uh, uh, from Stefan Schwedt from from Oxford. Um, the uh, uh, these questions basically relate back to uh, uh, to some of the perceptions of the EU and with it its uh, its credibility of engaging in support of democracy and civil society abroad. Uh, part of that question obviously relates to the uh, uh, to the fact that the EU is seen differentially. Uh, uh, bowing to the one autocrat and um, uh, sort of criticizing the other. The example here is uh, Serbia uh, and, and Turkey. Um, uh, this is often driven by party politics inside of the uh, inside of the EU. The entire story with the EPP and, and Fides uh, in Hungary. So uh, here the question is: uh, uh, How is our support uh, related uh, or impacted um, uh, by some of these uh, uh, some of these party political or geopolitical uh, mechanisms? Uh, the second question is more to do with uh, whether or not the EU is too directly involved uh, in. Supports uh, for democracy, um, whether there is a, a, a again a perceptions differential uh, between ourselves, where we see uh, and, and pronounce ourselves a block of values, but on the uh, on the outside, more often than not, we're seen as a as a trade block, as an uh, economic union more than anything else. So here again, uh, there, there seems to be a um, a mismatch uh, uh, that that impacts our democracy and civil society supports. Um, I would probably add a third question from myself, and it relates already to something that, that Richard has said uh, on the example of the Norway grant. Um, uh, in its external relations and democracy support, the EU is not the only actor uh, uh, when it comes to the EU level itself. Uh, at least as much uh, support comes from individual EU member states, uh, not equally uh, uh, across them, but um, uh, Sweden, Germany, uh, Poland, the Czech Republic are very strong actors in this, uh, uh, in this field. Uh, now, in reverse, this would obviously mean that not only do they have uh, 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 their own experiences uh, with uh, support for civil society, some of it may uh, may match and parallel those of the EU. Some of the experiences may also be different. Um, uh, but in reverse, this also means that uh, um, uh, individual EU member states should also be playing a role uh, when it comes to bolstering civil society and, uh, um, uh, and democracy inside of the, uh, of the European Union. Uh, the example that we that we heard about is uh, obviously Norway as an uh, um, a European Economic Area member, um, uh, and it's faced huge difficulties in uh, in places like Hungary. So uh, here again, is there uh, is there a role for EU member states uh, in that sort of support inside of the uh, uh, of the EU? That would be my question. Um, Pavel, um, go ahead with it. Thank you so much. Again, excellent questions. Uh, yeah, this this is uh, 
this keeps to be challenging, but uh, it's it's very uh, interesting. Um, so first, uh, the question of Alexandra actually and the reach of uh, small uh, communities, uh, rural communities. This actually, um, again, I will go back to uh, the situation of Moldova. And despite the fact that I have criticized the practice of subgranting somehow for missing some of the kind of strategic vision and sustainability, this is actually an excellent way how to get uh, support to really remote communities and organ uh, organization with uh, just a few people. This is this is really. Um, obviously, there is a whole uh, network and, and architecture in place. Uh, I spoke about the three, three, three big partners who actually won uh, the grants from the uh, European uh, Commission, but then they have their own partners in the regions. So, so through this, through a network of, of organizations, this actually is where we can bring EU money through really, uh, I will describe the three actually so there are three groups actually for small organizations. It's, it is up to 10,000 for middle-sized organization up to 30,000. And for the biggest ones, it's actually up to 60,000 uh, uh, euros. So this way we, you can get the support to even small organization. And this is actually a very interesting way. Um, um, for, 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 the, for the Eastern partnership, there is a whole system of uh, so-called uh, partnership framework uh, between the commission and uh, kind of network of NGOs and network of civil society that actually are helping to disperse and, and to engage in this uh, kind of localization and regionalization of the funding. So, so this, is, this is one way. Um, another way uh, was, uh, another part of the question is actually uh, about the diasporas. And here I would bring the example from this uh, AIHDHR, uh, the European um, uh, instrument for democracy and human rights, which has actually a regional component. So uh, it combines actually several, for example, Eastern partnership countries, and you can put uh, people together, human rights defenders, for example, and you can bring them together from, from Ukraine, Georgia, and, and Moldova, for example, or other, other three, four countries. So this is possible, and we should be, again, drawing and, and bringing uh, this, this lesson back to the EU itself. Uh, what doesn't work and doesn't work also for the uh, EED is to again bridge this gap inside outside and we should be we should be uh, kind of bringing that uh, back to the back to the focus uh, the second question of uh, Stefan um, this is quite philosophical to me I, I will try to comment uh, um, this uh, about perception of the EU engagement with civil society if we have double standards um, and party politics I, I would uh, I would go back to what Richard mentioned. We can't allow uh, to go in this right or left uh, kind of division, ideal, ideological uh, kind of struggles when it comes to the domestic support for civil society. But indeed, we have seen that uh, abroad. You know, when again I, I can mention Ukraine, I can mention uh, Georgia or Moldova. Moldova is a great case where EED obviously is. Uh, it's, uh, um, EPP, pardon me, uh, is in a huge opposition against uh, the current elite and the socialists. They have been trying to 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 kind of shield this criticism of of Mr. Dodon and other ones, but just because they are uh, affiliated on, on on a party basis. So we should be avoiding this. Uh, then the, the 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 solution from my side is. Uh, um, as, as we mentioned, establish this semi-independent semi instrument such as EED or something, what uh, it was proposed uh, in 2018 by the European Parliament, this uh, European Democracy Fund, which would actually have the same role as EED, but for domestic purposes, but be obviously, uh, be controlled by the member states and um, to have this kind of control mechanism as, as it is now with EED, but to in fact, stand outside of its control. Um, uh, when it comes to uh, if in, in if movement, uh, differentiation between a block of values, economic union, this is quite philosophical point of view. It, it is a very relevant uh, question, I guess, and depends on, on individual opinions, I guess. I am uh, the guy who supports the union of and block of values. And here, I think we are primarily discussing this. But obviously for others and this sovereignist movement, this might be reduced all the way to this single market. I, I don't think this is true anymore. We have now Lisbon Treaty in place. We have a certain things uh, happening and, and we should be discussing values because otherwise just, just being just based around uh, the economic issues is not enough for the EU to survive. 
that's that's my certain belief. Finally, on on the domestic component and an example of Norway um, complementarity and and the member states, I will again. Um, kind of bring uh, the experience of Czechia because I did myself a uh, rather comprehensive study of the state of uh, civil society in Czechia. And actually in uh, somehow uh, somewhere in 2014, there was a, a very uh, like excellent document uh, uh, called strategic engagement with civil society between 2015 and 20. Now works are being done for 20 to 30. This is prepared by the office of the Czech government. Problem is obviously with uh, the implementation and the political resistance, but on the bureaucratic level, there is a very huge uh, level of recognition of civil society as a partner. And all the right things are being said. Obviously, large, la to large degree, things remained on paper, but there is, there is this genuine belief in, 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 in the Czech context that civil society is a partner and, and somehow um, a, a way to actually provide uh, service to, to, to work with citizens to stand between the state and, and the people. So it really depends on individual situation. In the Czech case, we are, I am trying to be quite positive, even if the, the tendencies are uh, overall rather negative. Thank you. Thank, thanks a lot, Pavel. Richards? on those questions? I don't have too much to add at this stage, just to say I think uh, Stefan's two uh, points are very, very good and, and very, very important. Um, he mentions the discrepancy between policy on Serbia and Turkey. I would add to that that the EU also needs to be seen to be playing an even hand within the EU um, itself between different member states. We, we all know that what's going on in Hungary and Poland is a, is a lot worse than what's going on in other member states. There's no equivalence but there are lots of uh, democratic problems and democratic regression going on in, in other member states as well. And if the EU is going to be focusing more assertively, which I think it should on those two uh, cases, it shouldn't be turning a, a complete blind eye to problems in, in other countries as well. And I think his point about uh, rule of law and democracy support uh, being above party politics is a very, very difficult thing to do, but it's absolutely uh, important. Uh, I think we all know that um, um, Roland and others might want to come in on this, that the, the argument of many conservatives is that a lot of these democracy programs are supporting anti-conservative agendas more than they're supporting pro-democratic agendas. I don't think that's the case, but I think it might be good for the EU to pay special attention through some kind of special initiatives with conservative forces to, um, to, to, to clarify and to stress that you can uh, have conservative values prospering in an environment that is fully democratic, that supporting rule of law and democratic values is not a, an agenda that needs to be intrinsically against conservative values. So I think that's a challenge that, uh, that needs to be um, addressed. And then I think his question about whether the EU is too directly involved um, is, is a difficult, it's kind of uncomfortable one for people like us on this call, I suppose. For me, the worst thing the EU can do is talk up its commitment in a very assertive way, rhetorically, to these values, but then in practice do nothing. It seems to me that's what breeds the um, uh, scepticism that he mentions in, that Stefan mentions in his question. And it seems to me in a way we might be better talk, uh, dialing down the rhetoric a little bit on EU values and doing things quietly on the ground that just uh, build a democratic capacity in a very incremental way. In most countries, EU policy is not going to be the big arbiter of whether a country democratizes or not. It's not the really primary factor. It seems to me the essential thing is whether the EU understands the range of domestic forces working for and against democracy and whether it can kind of lock on to that domestic array of factors and at least in a secondary way, make sure it helps rather than hinders democratic development. Thanks a lot, Richard. I don't see any more questions. So uh, this is probably then the point where we close it here. I personally learned a lot from this. Uh, 
I come back to you uh, probably in a uh, in a second. I I learned massively from uh, from your paper, uh, uh, Pavel. Also, as we uh, as we went through the research uh, uh, with you, uh, I'm very happy that uh, uh, we got so many very very good questions uh, on the uh, on the issue. There is certainly plenty more, especially once uh, once we all have a closer look at the uh, at the paper for the first time, or again also for ourselves. Uh, so I mean this. Is uh, this is surely a discussion to be uh, to be continued. So in that sense, I would see this as a um, sort of as a first kickoff here. Uh, I know that Pavel is uh, is also ready to continue that conversation, uh, whether in particular places, especially in Brussels uh, uh, or other locations or else online. Uh, but Pavel, you wanted to come in uh, uh, again. Yes, just very briefly, Jörg. Thank you so much. Um, so I just wanted to subscribe to what Richard mentioned because um, actually the principle of uh, inclusivity is is a crucial one in, in indeed. Uh, this goes for different ideologies, but this goes also for different sizes of organizations being based in the capital or in the regions being based around the advocacy related topics or just simply um, service providing. This should be should be all in our toolbox and we should be really inclusive as much as is it, uh, it's possible. And I know that uh, Richard and his team actually ha have done an interesting um, study in this uh, phenomenon. Uh, both in, in the EU, in case of Poland, but also in, in Georgia, this kind of uh, um, conservative civil society, this is, uh, is a great paper that I had, uh, had a look at with great interest. One, one more thing that I will add is, um, and this is also related to something that I forgot to mention earlier on the Gongo debate, because we need to have uh, simplified procedures for the civil society and to really, uh, you know, have everybody on board, you know, when uh, nowadays the, the commission has uh, uh, criteria having at least two, two years of experience to have uh, this and that being registered and so on, this is just too, too rigid, you know, we need to go beyond that. We have seen that the EU has been experimenting with that and, you know, trying to enlarge this and made it uh, make its, uh, its own criteria more simply simplified but we get uh, we guess uh, i guess we should uh, be going further further than that and uh, here in the in the recommendation section you will find also a very important component of decreasing the amount of co-funding you know which is now 10 percent for the domestic actors which is in countries such as Moldova, Georgia, sometimes very, very complicated to meet. But for international and these network NGOs, it might be up to up to 20%, which is ridiculously a lot if you think that these, these organizations are really genuinely interested in, in uh, getting the message and then the support uh, across uh, different landscapes. So, so with that, I'm passing back the word uh, to you, Jörg, and let me once again thank you so much for putting this together and helping me with the paper. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks a lot, Pavel. As you see, Pavel is very keen on uh, continuing that conversation. So you will run into open doors if, uh, uh, if beyond this uh, webinar, you contact him for clarification with questions uh, uh, on the paper, on the ideas that are in there. Surely a discussion that will continue and should continue. Uh, but at this stage, we uh, we will close it here. Uh, uh, thank you very much for joining us for this. Uh, thank you especially to Pavel and Richard for uh, being with us uh, uh, on this uh, very topic. Uh, let me also immediately uh, uh, add in a commercial here. We will have a next webinar of this kind within this series of our Rethink CE Fellowship in two weeks from now on the 15th of July. Uh, we will then have a, a, a discussion on party political engagement in Central and Eastern Europe, how to boost uh, um, the, basically the, the social roots of, uh, of political parties, whether it's membership or otherwise engagement. Uh, we will have uh, uh, one of Pavel's uh, colleagues on that, uh, on that webinar, Jan Jakub Plomiec from, uh, from Poland. Uh, he will present uh, his paper. We will then have a discussion on that very issue. And obviously, uh, I hope that many of you will uh, join us for that conversation as well. You will certainly receive an invitation for that. Uh, with that, thank you very much again. Uh, this was a most enjoyable afternoon. Uh, and I hope we will all uh, see you all uh, on similar occasions again.